All right, let's get started. Welcome to today's webinar, the Dementia Hearing Loss Connection. I'm your host, Janet Barker Evans. And today we're gonna to learn more about this connection and how it's inspired new assistive devices that are being used at Brookdale and other senior living communities. So today you might be joining us on Zoom, but we're also simulcasting on Facebook Live. So before I introduce our panelists, let's just take a minute to talk about how you can interact with us during the webinar. If you're on Zoom, things can be a little bit different from computer to computer, but if you look at the bottom of the Zoom screen where you're seeing this webinar, you'll see some icons. The one on the far left is usually a microphone. Now we've muted your voice so there's no background sound, but you can ask for question, you can ask questions or get some technical help by using the chat button below. So if you type into the chat button, our moderators can help you if you have a question. And the Q&A button is gonna be very important. This is where we want you to type in any questions you have for the Q&A session we're gonna have at the end. You can start typing questions in any time during the webinar, and we're gonna to get to as many as we can at the end. If you're on Facebook Live, simply pop any questions or any issues into the comment box and our moderator will see them there. And then after the webinar, you're gonna get a follow-up email with all of this information, as well as a recording of the webinar so you can refer to it later or share it with your friends and loved ones. Ready to go? All right, <clears throat> let's jump in and meet our panelists, Dr. Lisa Rickard, Matt Reiners, and Juliet Holt-Klinger. Dr. Lisa Rickard is a licensed audiologist and clinical educator with over 30 years of experience. She earned her doctorate in audiology from the University of Florida. Lisa specializes in the evaluation of hearing loss and rehabilitation in adults via the use of hearing aids, wireless accessories, and he hearing assistive technology. She's especially interested in helping her patients and their communication partners manage the impact of hearing loss on relationships, cognition, health outcomes, and quality of life. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you, Janet. Next up, Matt Reiners. Matt is the co-founder of Eversound, a technology company dedicated to ending social isolation for older adults by giving everyone the gift of hearing. So after seeing his grandmother struggle with hearing, Matt and his co-founders saw an opportunity to help improve a resident's quality of life through better listening experiences. Matt's a serial entrepreneur, and he's helped start two additional companies and is an up-and-comer in the senior living industry. Matt is a recipient of the 2018 Forbes 30 Under 30, a 2019 Argentum Senior Living Leader Under 40, and the 2018 National Association of Activity Professionals Business Affiliate Award of Excellence. Wow, welcome, Matt. Thanks so much. I'm not that cool, I promise, but thank you. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> We've built you up. we built you up. <laughs> That's great. Uh, finally, Juliet. Juliet is an accomplished senior living executive with more than 35 years of experience designing and executing cutting edge Alzheimer's and dementia care programs in both assisted and skilled living settings. She specializes in developing and directing, directing the highest quality person-centered care and programming possible. Julia is a strong advocate for those living with dementia and their care partners. She's deeply committed to improving the cultural acceptance of those with cognitive differences. Welcome, Juliet. Thanks, Janet. It's great to be here today. I think we've got a really exciting topic today. <clears throat> we sure do. We're going to begin, actually, by spending some time talking with Lisa about the dementia and hearing loss connection. So, Lisa, we tend to associate hearing loss with aging, and we know that dementia affects a portion of aging adults, too. Can you explain how these two things might be connected and what the latest research says? And you are on mute. I lost my screen for a moment. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, so yes, the attention to age-related hearing loss has grown significantly over the past decade. And in fact, it's among the top three most common conditions affecting older adults after heart disease and arthritis. And certainly as the population ages, the incidence of age-related hearing loss is going to increase as well. Um, for example, we know that over half of those um, in the 70 to 79 age bracket have significant hearing loss. 
and over 80% of those in the um, 80 and over um, age range have significant hearing loss. So the functional implications of that are, are profound for that population. And we know that hearing disability is a very important issue in geriatric healthcare because it's associated with numerous um, health conditions that I'm going to discuss a bit later. And is it a coincidence that these two are related? Like, do they just happen at the same time coincidentally, or could there be some kind of a causal effect between one or the other? It's a great question. Um, so the latest research does show a correlation or relationship between untreated hearing loss and numerous health issues, as I mentioned earlier. For example, cognitive decline, uh, poor balance, increase in the risk for falls, increased hospitalizations, um, social isolation, depression, loss of autonomy. And what we're thinking the, um, the connection or the relationship is, is something that multiple researchers are calling these mechanistic pathways. So there's not necessarily a physiological connection, but there are these underlying mechanistic pathways. For example, the idea of cognitive load. If a person is having to struggle every day, all day to um, encode a garbled auditory message, that is just going to draw resources from other um, higher level um, cognitive skills, such as attention, memory, cognition, executive function. It's very effortful and very tiring to have to listen so hard. Um, fMRI has actually shown changes in brain function and structure, actually decreased volume in the temporal lobe, which is where hearing and language all occurs. And then, as I mentioned, the whole idea of when it's so hard to hear, people just check out. They become socially isolated, which leads to a whole cascade of you know, depression, they become more sedentary, they, um, which increases their risk of falls. So there's just a whole cascade of events. Um, to date, we know that these mechanistic pathways um, uh, happen. The question that needs to be answered yet is, um, well, then does treating hearing loss prevent or delay cognitive decline? And we don't have a definitive answer to that yet, but what I know from spending 30 years doing this is that when we can mitigate some of the effects of hearing loss, it has a profound impact on all of these other um, health and social issues for sure. In, in some cases, untreated hearing loss can even be mistaken for dementia too, right? Absolutely, absolutely. We can touch on more on that later, I believe. And can you explain the difference between causation and correlation for our audience? I know mm -hmm. it can be confusing for those of us that aren't like all science minded sometimes that there that yeah. there's a distinction. Right. So causation just means that they're they are related. Um, so untreated hearing loss is related to social isolation. It's related to this effortful listening and cognitive load. Um, causation means that there's a a causal effect. So if if I know that hearing loss is related to social isolation or hearing loss is related to cognitive decline, then the next question is, so does untreated hearing loss cause cognitive decline? And if I treat with hearing aids, will that prevent um, cognitive decline? We don't have a definite answer to that yet. There, there are large scale studies underway to prove if treating hearing loss prevents or delays cognitive decline. But what I'm saying is I know for sure that treating hearing loss can mitigate some of these negative effects like the social isolation and the depression. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Matt, let's turn to you. Could you tell us how and when you first became interested in hearing loss? I understand you have a personal story about this. Yeah, absolutely. So we be first became interested in hearing loss. So we were doing another company in the special event space. And then two things kind of happened simultaneously. We started receiving phone calls from senior living communities, basically asking for help 
Uh, and what they were saying to us was that hearing was all over the place, especially in group programs, right? So think of movie night, resident council meetings, worship services, you know, anything like that, where everyone's hearing was at different levels. And there was a lot of background noise that were taking place. And it was really hard to focus on what was actually happening. Um, and it was around the same time that I, I really started to notice what my, my own grandmother was going through uh, in terms of her own hearing loss. And uh, I think the picture will come up here. Believe it or not, that is what I looked like about 30 years ago with the same haircut. Um, <laughs> That's then, awesome. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, my, actually my, my last photo with my grandmother, but you know, and seeing what, what she was, so she lived in a community in New Jersey. And what I noticed whenever I would go visit her, she would just be in her room by herself. I mean, there'd be programs happening, you know, the staff would do everything they could to bring her out, but she wouldn't go to any of the programs, events, even the mealtimes. Um, she just continued to isolate herself to her room and whether it was like blasting her television or listening to her romantic fantasy novels through her own headphone system um, really showed that there was, it, it, it was sad to see, right? And being a grandkid that would go in and, and visit my grandmother and see this and even struggle myself to even have a conversation with her because I would have to yell, right? And like, it's just felt demeaning to talk to someone that you love and someone that used to hold you on their lap as a baby, it's, you know, just to talk to her like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we've all been there. How did that experience then inspire you to create Eversound? Yeah, so it was around, so when I would go visit my grandmother, right, there was, noticed that she definitely was a candidate to have and wear hearing aids, but she just didn't want to, right? She didn't want to put them in. She didn't like the way they made her look, even though she really wouldn't leave her room. Um, so she would really isolate herself. And we started looking around and out there in the world to see like what other solutions might there be and, and really saw that there really wasn't a piece of technology designed for an older adult user designed for senior living communities. So like being easy to use, you know, move it around really, really simple. Um, and, and saw an opportunity to create something and, and do some good around it. And so that's kind of led us on this path where early on, you know, my co-founder Jake and Devin and I didn't really know any better. We just started walking into senior living communities with, with our early version of the system and some of the first demos would, you would see the staff crying. You would see their jaws on the ground. You would hear stories of, of residents thought to be nonverbal were actually singing along or talking. We would have residents coming up to us. I remember Vern Rockcastle who approached us, uh, 93 years old, independent living, wore hearing aids. He used our headphones for a resident council meeting, basically came up to us. And the first thing he said was, thank you. I've been coming to this meeting for seven years. And this was the first time I was been, I've been able to hear everything. And it was continuing to see experiences like that and continuing to see the experiences my, like my grandmother and, and having the opportunity to try Eversound with her before she passed away. Um, and, you know, had an opportunity to play some of her favorite music to her. And we ended up listening to some Glenn Miller together. You hear it okay? Yes. Loud. Loud? It's the first time I think she said everything. Anything was ever loud too. So. <laughs> Want to lower? No, I meant. Yeah. She wears. She wears them too. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's great. So tell us a little bit about how Eversound works. I know you said that's an early, um, an early example of it, but how does it work? Yeah, so Eversound is an amplification system that's designed for groups or one-on-one -on -one situations. And, and really there's a transmitter that you can plug any audio source into. So think television, AV system, computer, laptop, um, iPhone, iPods. Um, or a microphone, so lavalier mic, or we've got a wireless mic similar to the one I'm kind of wearing today. So you plug that directly into a transmitter. It then broadcasts to all the headphones wirelessly, and you can have up to 120 headphones to one transmitter. In each headphone, you can turn it up or turn it down. So what's nice about that 
It's amplifying what people should be listening to at a level comfortable to them and helps to alleviate some of the background noise that can be, you know, overwhelming or distracting at times. So they can adjust it themselves and it's got some noise cancellation within it. So I would say it's definitely noise reducing, not cancellation, just in case we still want people to be aware of their surroundings surroundings. in case like sirens are going off or anything like that. Um, But what's nice, yeah, so there's just a big volume up and a big volume down. So we really tried to strive for simplicity um, and also made them right, like hearing aid compatible, antimicrobial materials, the range, you're looking about 300 feet in all directions. Um, and no Wi-Fi or cellular reception, so you can bring it off campus um, and to the park. I've seen a community even bring it to Target for some reason, but... <laughs> from shopping. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's great. So Lisa, let's turn back to you. Can you explain why this kind of works to help um, communities and what's sort of the importance of this technology? Right. Well, just, you know, improving any individual's ability to hear speech and to hear the world around them improves their ability to engage on so many different levels. So you've heard Matt describe, um, you know, just engaging cognitively with music uh, and conversation. I saw a picture the other day of uh, a, a resident playing bingo and like that's a pretty heavy cognitive load to be able to do that and make that connection with you know hearing the numbers and and seeing if you have that that number on your bingo card um so it just allows people to participate more fully in all of the activities of of daily living so it improves a lot of those um, issues that i spoke of earlier it improves their social engagement It improves their physical engagement. I imagine these can be used for like the, like even seated exercise classes and such, Um, improves their cognitive engagement, like I just said. It also um, just improves their own self-efficacy. I thought it was interesting that Matt just mentioned that his grandmother, she didn't want to wear hearing aids because she didn't like the way they made her look. And it's important to know that even you know our seniors who maybe don't look like they used to but they're still concerned about that and how they see themselves and how they appear to the world um so it's just it's just improves their quality of life overall um and improves their ability to to age in a more healthy manner to whatever ability they can i think another interesting point that i just thought of is you know we think of the impact of devices such as Eversound on the individual that's wearing it, but it also impacts the family members, you know, how important is it to be able to have that conversation with your grandmother and maybe remember her a bit, you know, as she used to be or for, um, yeah, just for the family members who miss those connections and those conversations. So it's, it, it affects the, the family member, the caregiver, the communication partner as well, I think. Yeah, that ability to participate, right? In that group setting or in that interpersonal communication. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Matt, what has it been like bringing Eversound into different senior living communities? Yeah, so it's been super rewarding, but you know, as any entrepreneurial journey, it's it's definitely been a roller coaster ride. I think when we first started, I had a, a full head of hair in 2020 vision, and now it's illegal for me to drive at night without my glasses. And you can tell <laughs> the other part here, but it's it's just been so. And, and and you know, fast forward ever since we started this about five or six years ago, we're impacting over a thousand communities. You know, grateful for the opportunity to work with with Brookdale on, on some of those. Um, but really it, it's been amazing to see some of the stories of some of the family members and some of the residents and, and just the moments, you know, we talk of these moments of, of connection, these moments of, of love, this moments of positivity and to, I think, you know, those moments as we tend to get older tend to become fewer and fewer, um, which is unfortunate, but we're grateful for the opportunity to kind of create those and support some of the heroes in the front lines in these communities that are doing everything they can to really improve that resident experience um, and are grateful for the opportunity to continue to do that. That's great. So what kind of response have you been getting? Is there, are there some personal stories you could share with us? 
Yeah, so three stories come to mind. Um, one was from a community that I went and visited outside of Chicago that was interested in getting Eversound to their community. They're doing like a fundraiser for it and they had been using it for about a month or so. And I had a little table set up uh, and they actually gave me the guest suite. So it was really nice to stay in that community. Uh, but one of their residents came up to me uh, and I remember like it was yesterday, her name was Charlotte. And she doesn't even say hi. The first thing she says to me is, I have a new name for your company. And I was like, oh, crap, where is this going? Because everyone's brutally honest, right? And she went on to say she would name Eversound Heaven for Hearing. And she went on to tell me that she runs like a brain fitness class amongst her peers there. And before they got Eversound, people would leave out of frustration and, and get really frustrated with other, each other because people keep saying, what, I can't hear you, where people would just not come entirely. But what she was telling me since they started using Eversound in this group, that more people were coming, people were staying longer and what they were learning in this class, they could actually continue and keep the conversation going throughout the day. Um, so that was one thing that really stuck out to me. Another one was a community group, one of our partners uh, based in California um, that primarily deal in helping people living with dementia. And some of the stuff they were telling us is they thought where people were later stages of dementia because you know they weren't engaging, weren't participating, weren't even speaking. And they started using Eversound. And that's when they started to see almost like this, this veil come off and like people would start to engage, start singing. I, I, we probably have all seen the Alive Inside video and they're doing that, but like at scale. Um, and, and they also told us that they started using Eversound as a tool for whether redirection or even to reduce medication, which is just so powerful when you can think of a, a natural way to go about that. Uh, but yeah. I think one of my... Yeah, and, and one of my, my favorite stories uh, comes from one of our partners in Virginia uh, Commonwealth, where you know I, I want to introduce you to Mr. and Mrs. Thomas, who have been married for over 40 years. Um, you know, Mr. Thomas unfortunately started developing dementia, and when Mrs. Thomas could no longer take care of him, she moved him into the local community and would still visit him daily. And on this day in particular, uh, they decided to use Eversound to listen to their wedding song again. And she said it was the first time in those five years where she felt like a wife and not a caregiver. Wow. Can I jump in, Janet? Um, there's a question in the chat about how, to, how is this different than hearing aids? And I think this video is a great example that it provides a shared experience and, and maybe a private experience, right? Um, the other folks in the room can't hear the music that that couple is dancing to. It's just going through um, the the headphones to those um, to that couple. So it you know creates this intimate and shared experience as well. And I think Lisa talked about that um, yeah. a little bit with the application of this amplification system. And I know it sounds a little bit like a commercial forever sound. We're getting some comments about that. But, <laughs> but actually, this is the only game in town. This is the only technology of its sort um, that we've really been able to find um, that's applicable to senior living. So, um, you know, I do think that the, the application with family visiting and certainly during COVID when we had some you know, need to keep people apart or plexiglass screens in between people or those kinds of things. This technology really was able to, you know, bring people back into that yeah. intimate conversation that you expect to be able to have with your with your loved ones. Well, and that, that's the interesting part to me about what Matt was saying is when the hearing loss was addressed, when something was provided so that they could hear, it turns out some people weren't as they didn't have the level of dementia that was thought. They they were able to participate. Suddenly they could come back in to the environment, back into the community, back to their loved ones in a way that they may not have known. Like they, to your point, it wasn't as far gone as they thought, but the hearing is what prevented them from, from being part of that. And I think that that's kind of the key thing here is like fixing that problem or addressing the hearing problem allows people to participate more that's right and and i think that that's the critical part right and i don't think it matters how it is i mean yeah so yeah this is the and only game think, found, but regardless how you address it yeah and i think the other uh, point as it applies to dementia is that um as somebody who's worked with folks living with advanced dementia for over 35 years i can tell you that hearing aids are problematic with people beyond the middle stage um 
people no longer understand the meaning of having mm -hmm. something in their ear. This happens with dentures as well. And they may begin to reject the hearing aid over time. Um, they're also hard to keep track of. I know there's some devices out there to keep things clipped to people's shirts and that sort of thing. But um, people may actually just reject the feeling of the hearing aid um, and really not be able to do all that cognitive work of, of bringing in that information from the ear and interpreting it in the brain and the parietal lobe of the brain, right? That's really going to become affected. Um, and, and to Lisa's point, you know, the, the amount of cognitive drain that that really puts on folks um, trying to figure out what they're hearing, what they're listening to when things are muffled. And this is a very easy, um, easy, sim you know, we have not had a lot of issues with folks rejecting the headphones. And I think they may be more comfortable. Um, they're not walking around with them all of the time. And so I think it is uh, sometimes a lot easier for folks with dementia to get used to this device. What's it comfortable? It's a known use case, right? Like we understand how those work, right? You know what a headphone is, yeah. We know what those are, right? We've worn them our whole lives. So what what, what started you bringing Eversound into Brookdale? So, you know, I'm always, I'm constantly looking for um, great technology that applies. Um, well, and sometimes I, I run into technology that maybe the, the user didn't think was going to apply, right? Um, to dementia or to, to even issues of aging. And I think Eversound's a great example of that. These were uh, uh, pretty young men when I met them uh, to Matt's point. And, um, you know, they were, they were interested in things that uh, creating devices that applied to younger people. And I think when they saw the use case for aging and for dementia, um, realize that's a that's an awfully big market out there, right? So um, I'm always interested in technology that has a purpose and a meaning for uh, for aging, and really something that helps us provide what I call a prosthetic environment at Clarebridge. Um, you know, we really try to make sure that everything we have in the environment helps support that person um, with those symptoms of dementia and doesn't, you know further cause what we call excess disability, right? Where um, those symptoms of dementia are made worse by something in the environment. And hearing loss is, is one of those things that certainly can make those symptoms of dementia worse. So, um, so I was excited when I saw the technology you know, we did a little pilot. We didn't really need to call it a pilot because I was pretty sure the technology was was effective after seeing um, seeing it in use and using it myself. Um, and then uh, we're slowly uh, starting to introduce it into our communities um, and and really seeing a very positive uh, response, um, both in group you know group settings um and the ability things like the resident council meetings playing bingo um you know exercise class those types of things yeah i you know the cognitive load that lisa talked about something i never really even considered like all of that and like early on you know convincing people to keep their hearing aid in but certainly in these community situations giving them a tool or a device that helps them participate and connect is great yeah. Um, can you share with us a little bit about the residents' experience with the technology at Brickdow? Yeah, I think it's been it's been extremely positive. And you know, to Matt's point, that you know there are these stories, these very positive stories. And I think, you know, we were lucky that we had just started this um, process with Eversound prior to the pandemic and prior to the restrictions that were placed on us during the pandemic. And of course, during the pandemic, we saw this explosion in um, virtual visiting, right? As you see here uh, in this picture, where I think we were using an iPad um, to visit, and you know the the technology is helping this person, you know, hear the iPad, and that's really critical. Um, again, going back to what I was talking about with those intimate visits, this is our community in Oklahoma City, Southwest. Um, and they do a tremendous job and did through the pandemic of, of continuing on with traditions. This is a couple celebrating, uh, I believe their wedding anniversary. Uh, one is a resident in the Clare Ridge and, and obviously one is a visitor and they were able to continue to have that intimate dinner, um, you know, because of the use of the Eversound. And then here, a, a great example of, um, you know, being able to get 
uh, directions for exercise to into people's um, into people's ears. Um, and you know, those folks are all in different places. And and that was certainly happening during uh, the pandemic. We had folks sitting in their doorways doing, you know, all down a hallway and they all had the system on and were able to hear um, the the coordinator who might have been moving up and down the hallways. So um, it it really does help us with group programming as well. Yeah, that ability to participate in all of those things yeah. and be equal, right? Yeah. Everyone can adjust it to themselves. And I think that that yeah you know that mutuality is important so really quick i want to remind everyone we're going to get to a q a session in a minute if you have a question please use the q a button i see some questions already coming in so that's great please use the q a and drop any questions in there we're going to get to those in a few minutes um lisa i'd like to turn back to you what should those of us with senior loved ones or ourselves look out for in terms of dementia and hearing loss mm -hmm. well um there's no doubt that hearing loss can can be misconstrued for dementia mistaken for dementia so when we see someone who is maybe uninterested in participating disconnected um, unable to answer or participate appropriately um, reluctant to engage socially um, is this simply because they can't hear or do they have some cognitive decline I mean, the reality is in the population that we're talking about, it's probably a bit of both. But at the very least, we need to try to ferret out, you know, is this hearing loss? If I give this person some type of amplification, are they going to be able to participate? And again, I have seen people's faces light up. I have had patients who the first time that I saw them, I thought for sure this person has significant cognitive decline. And when I put in my setting here at the university, when I put hearing aids on them, they were not at all cognitively impaired. So we have to ferret out what's hearing loss, what's dementia. The reality is it's probably some of both. Um, and we have to think of this as um, almost like a double hit on the brain. So this population that we're discussing today Yes, they probably all do have some level of cognitive decline and dementia, but then when you add an untreated hearing loss on top of that, it serves as just a double hit on the brain. So if we can alleviate at least part of that, it's going to, you know, again, help their quality of life, maybe um, prevent some of those other issues that I mentioned, like the social isolation, the physical decline. Um, the increase in falls, which is huge in this population. Yeah, you know, one other big thing that strikes me is, uh, as as Lisa's speaking, is this is another area of aging where we see stigma really affect mm -hmm. um, folks' uh, ability to live a full life and improve their well being. And mm -hmm. I have a dear friend um, whose father is. You know, cognitively he's great. He's a retired gentleman. He's a he's a widower. He's you know he's he's out and about, but socially he's really been suffering um, because he just can't hear. And mm -hmm. the stigma of not wanting to be seen with a hearing aid was keeping him from from essentially participating in all aspects of life. He no longer went out to dinner. He was you know he sat in a and a chair at family events and didn't, you know, didn't participate in the conversation at all. And it was finally one of his peers who got a hearing aid and said, look, you can't even see it. It's not, you know, it's nothing. Just go in and do it. Um, it was finally really hearing from one of his peers that he was, yeah. he was being stubborn about this and needed mm -hmm. to, to move on. But, you know, you wonder as, as the population ages and as we um, really move into this elder bloom that we're moving into demographically, if, you know, hearing aids aren't the new iPods or- Oh yeah, you know, right, we're so used to wearing kind of them. Okay now to wear, but I think you combine that stigma of, of being hard of hearing and the, the, you know, really ageist, you know, awful kind yeah. of depictions of, eh, you know, that we've heard yeah. all our lives along with confusion and early confusion that people may feel um, and sorting all of that out. There's a lot, you know, we, we need to be mindful of how stigma affects yeah. uh, people's ability to get these issues uh, taken yeah. care of. 
and it's interesting because yes, hearing aids have come such a long way from the ones that my grandparents wore, right? They're right. smaller, they're more discreet. And you're right, that social proof of here's somebody that has one that's using it successfully. Right. Like a lot of that, I think will go a long way to helping them realize that this can help improve your life. And they are more discreet. Yeah. And yeah, AirPods, we're all gonna be wearing them. Right. We already do. <laughs> one, one thing that I did wanna mention that I thought of, uh, regarding some of the questions that I've seen about, well, how do these differ from hearing aids and why are we talking about devices like this? Um, there are barriers to hearing health care. Stigma is one of them. But in again, in the population that we're talking about here, other barriers are cost and accessibility. I don't know how many people realize that almost no insurance companies cover hearing aids and they can cost thousands of dollars. They do cost thousands of dollars. And for some people, that's just not a possibility. And then there's the issue of accessibility. I work at the University of Maryland. People need to come to the university for multiple visits for me to fit them appropriately with hearing aids. That's probably not feasible for a lot of people in the adult living communities that we're talking about. So a device, any device that's going to help them to hear better and engage better is, is a good thing um, that can overcome barriers for, um, yeah. 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 Great. And just to add to that, I mean, ever sound aside, I think Dr. Ricker brings up a great point because, you know, when you, when you asked what got me interested in hearing loss, Ever sound aside, the numbers say about 80% of people over the age of 85 have some sort of hearing loss. One in five that could benefit from a hearing aid are actually using one on a consistent right. basis. Right. And there's this huge gap, you know, call it the silent mm -hmm. epidemic with a pun intended. And Dr. Rickard mm -hmm. hit all of the negative health effects. And I think if there's one thing to take of this is healthy hearing is important and mm -hmm. looking for tools to help you to do that is important as well, whatever that might be. Ever sound aside, we're not trying to sell anything to anybody on this call. Um, we're just excited at the opportunity to bring more light and spotlight this issue as being a critical issue to you know older adults across the entire world. Well, Matt, and, it, and I think that's it's valuable. Health, it, hearing is health, right? I mean, it is part of health. And so um, it's an important topic in whatever way we can we can help people with that. It's going to help their overall life, their health, their their socialism, all of that, socialization, all of that. So, well, let me just make one other point so on, sure, of to, that, to that to this this um, thought line. Dr. Frank Lynn at Johns Hopkins does a lot of research in this area, and he has a really powerful slide or point that he makes. Is he'll show a picture of a hearing test result of a mild to moderate hearing loss, which is significant, and then he'll show a 12 year old child, and he'll say, "This is this child's hearing loss." Nobody would argue that that child needs amplification for obvious reasons. But what if this same hearing loss belonged to this 82 year old man? Oh, wow, well, it's just aging. No, it has definite implications, all these health implications that I've mentioned today, and it needs to be treated too. So um, we need to start thinking along those lines that it matters for older people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and Lisa, are there ways that we can help prevent or delay hearing loss and dementia? Well, we, uh, we're hearing more and more about a concept called the life course approach to just healthy aging or to aging in general. The concept that um, healthy aging starts very early on and there, it's a lifelong process. And there are some things that we can't control. I can't control my genetics or my biology to a degree. I can't control my, um, my environment or my socioeconomic status, but there are some things that I can control. And this is where I have to try to educate people. I can control my exposure to noise and I can start that early on. I can be aware of other um, habits that may impact my hearing, uh, smoking, some medications, and if I can educate people early on that these things matter as we progress through our life, and it's not only for hearing, it's for everything, right? We have to think in terms of a long-term um, life course approach. The good news, though, is that hearing loss is considered what we call a modifiable late life risk factor. So some things 
for me, if you know, what's going to determine if I get heart disease, diabetes as I age, or things that I did back in my 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, <clears throat> um, that's a long term. But hearing loss, with hearing loss, it's never too late to start to engage somebody. So even if they're 70 or 80 or 90, it's never too late to change some of these negative effects of untreated hearing loss. So, I mean, to your answer, I have to try to educate people of, about the things that they can control. I try to educate them about the um, impact of untreated hearing loss. I try to reduce the stigma, encourage people to be tested earlier and more often and to act earlier because the sooner you um, uh, address hearing loss, the easier it's going to be for you long-term in terms of mitigating some of these other negative impacts like the cognitive decline and the social isolation. So education, reduction of stigma, and knowing that it's never too late to start this. That's great, thank you. Thank you so much. So we have a lot of questions coming in the Q&A button. So it's time to hear from all of you. If you have any questions and you haven't popped them in yet, please do. Um, to ask your question, look for the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen, click Q&A, type in your question and then send it in. And we're gonna get to as many questions as we want. And don't worry, like I said, you're all gonna get a follow-up email with this, a recording of the webinar. You can refer to it later or share it with family and friends. So the first question <clears throat> is, and, and Matt, I think this is for you. Maybe I'm not understanding, but what makes Eversound different than any headphone I can go buy at a store? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. And I wish I wish there wasn't that many differences because it would have been a lot cheaper to develop this product from, from scratch. Uh, really what's different in this is headphones are great one-to-one, -one, right? If I am have my headphones paired to my iPhone, amazing. It, it helps me. But where we saw the problem is, is when groups of people are getting together, again, think like resident council meetings, bingo, fitness classes, everyone's hearings at different levels. So this allows, I think, Julia, you kind of said it best, a shared experience. So people are listening to the same thing at a level comfortable to them. So imagine if you're all in the worship service, you've got the headphones, you're all listening to the same thing, but you're listening at a level comfortable to them. And also with the, the microphone input of the transmitter, we definitely find that's helpful. It's not just something that listens to music or the TV. There's a microphone component, so I could just plug that directly into the transmitter and it then would broadcast to that headphone. Got it. And, and a quick follow on that. Do you use ever sound with your hearing aids? Like, are you putting it on over your hearing aids or are these different things? You use your hearing aid when you're not using this. How do they work together or do they? Yes. Yeah. So we designed every sound with purpose. Um, we did design it so it is hearing aid compatible. So people can put it right on top of their hearing aids, no problem. Um, I've also seen situations of people taking out their hearing aids, which we usually don't recommend. Uh, and then putting Eversound on and they've actually told us they can hear better. Cause again, it's amplifying what they should be listening to. Got it. And um, a question for you, um, Lisa. Whoop, it just scooted away, right? Was it? Are there any non-obvious early signs of hearing loss that we should look out for in ourselves or loved ones in order to treat it early? Anything that's like non-obvious? Um, non-obvious would be, I don't know, I think of most things are more obvious, like they answer wrong, they don't seem to be hearing you. Um, possibly some reluctance to participate socially mm -hmm. at, you know, and someone who maybe used to be uh, all about going out socially. So if you see some uh, reluctance to participate, I might want to know why. Um, but not, and there's a lot of obvious things, but not obvious. Um, yeah, to think about I think for a the interesting point uh, for for me is that these are often some of the same uh, symptoms of, of early dementia and of mild cognitive impairment. And um, I think a good hearing evaluation is always um, mm -hmm. 
a good idea when you're seeing a change in someone's social behavior. So someone who's no longer going to the card game they were going to, or no longer wanting to go to church when they were avid churchgoers, or someone who's really pulling out of, um, and it, you know, is that a lack of initiative and a lack of um, in wanting their, you know, their cognitive um, differences highlighted, or is it that they can no longer hear? And I think it's, it's really important to sort those things out when you're seeing those types of changes. That's great. That's great. We have a question from Mary. My mom's hearing has deteriorated to the point where even with hearing aids, she only gets muffled sounds. Would this device have a greater level of capability than what the hearing aids provide? For example, if she can't even hear their hearing aids, would this product help work any better for her? Is that for, yeah, for me? me Sorry, or... Matt, that would be for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would probably ask the audiologist on this. I've, I've definitely have seen scenarios mm -hmm. where, you know, people who thought, you know, they found the hearing aids wouldn't help them that ever sound was because again, it's, they could turn it up right there and it's amplifying what people should be listening to. So I have seen some scenarios that people thought that they, they couldn't hear or, or they were struggling with hearing aids and have been successful with Eversound. Um, but <laughs> I, I'd be curious of Dr. Rickard of, of your take of it. Yeah, um, so it's, it's hard to comment on that, of course, without knowing the person's degree of hearing loss and if the hearing aids are appropriately fit. But what I can say is that in a group setting, like in a, uh, an exercise class or a group meeting or a church service, one of the biggest problems that people report with hearing aids is that they have a lot of difficulty in background noise. Because you have to realize that the little microphones on hearing aids are designed for a conversational distance, six to eight feet. And they're going to pick up everything. They're going to pick up the speech. And they're also going to pick up that background noise with a system that um, such as Eversound or I can, you know, other devices that we can get that work in combination with the hearing aid. You're delivering that signal from the sound source, whether it's somebody wearing a, a lavalier mic or a um, boom mic like Matt has on now is delivering it from their mouth into your ears. So it's overcoming the negative effects of distance and interfering background noise. So that can clear up a lot of uh, just interfering background noise. All of us think of when you go into a very noisy restaurant and you still struggle, even if you have normal hearing, and that's because you have all this competing noise. So these systems overcome the negative effects of background noise and distance, deliver the signal that you want right to the person's ear. That's and Janet, you know, it's interesting, again, here's another place where this is exactly what we hear from folks who are living with early stage dementia. Um, I've been involved in a planning committee for a conference uh, welcoming, uh, you know, folks living with dementia and folks not living with dementia. And one of the accommodations we made at the conference was that each person living with dementia had a paddle that they could put up if, if they needed the speaker to slow down or if there was too much background noise. Um, so, so people living with early dementia describe some of the very same things, making it very difficult to interpret what they're hearing um, because of their brain, not because of their ears, right? So, I mean, it is really interesting to me, the intersection between some of these things from a communication standpoint, um, much of the approach. So, so the original question I think was, what do I do with this person who really just can no longer hear, even with the hearing aids, then we need to begin to rely on those approach things, you know, eye contact, facial, you know, expression. Um, people with dementia in general are looking to the environment for cues as to how to how to think about what's happening. How should I be responding? What, what, um, what can I pick up through my senses that will help me interpret what's going on around me. So they rely on those sensory um, cues a whole lot more. And so things like touch, you know, good, soft, you know, reassuring touch, um, certainly the look on our face and how we are presenting uh, to them can be, can be really, really a, a critical thing to step those up as the hearing goes. Absolutely. Um, oh, Lisa, quick question for you coming in from Facebook. 
This person says, my mom had tinnitus for many years and then it went away. Is this common? No, <laughs> it's not. And for it's, it's lucky. Away. It's lucky. It's lucky. That's for sure. Yes, it's, it's not common for it to go away. So I'm happy for her. Um, tinnitus can be so problematic for so many people. And we don't exactly know what causes it or where in the auditory pathway it's occurring. But if she had it for years and it went away, that is a very good thing. Um, important to note, like it doesn't necessarily mean that it went away because her hearing declined. So now she can't hear it. Because even deaf people have tinnitus, believe it or not, deaf and have tinnitus. So that's what I mean when I say we don't exactly know where in the auditory nerve pathways it occurs. <laughs> yes. So it, it can, people with perfectly normal hearing can have tinnitus. People, deaf people can have tinnitus. So I'm glad that it went away. Huh. That is not good. <laughs> and there's a question coming in, Matt, for you, if ever sound works for those with tinnitus. I think that's, I've, I've yet to hear of a scenario, uh, you know, I can't speak in fact statements. I haven't heard of someone with tinnitus or tinnitus using Eversound and, and using it. Again, I, I would I would defer to the audiologist on the call and, and Dr. Rickard, yeah. of what do you think about that? Yeah, anytime that we can um, use some external stimulus to help to, to mask over a person's internal noise, that is often a good thing. So some people who have tinnitus report that just wearing hearing aids because they're picking up more extraneous external sounds, it just helps to mask over their tinnitus. So I, I wouldn't use it as you know uh, a treatment for tinnitus. There are other treatments for tinnitus, but I can see where wearing something like this or wearing a hearing aid definitely Definitely people report that it um, alleviates by masking over their tinnitus. Got it. We have another question for you, Juliet, coming in from Facebook. Um, my dad has moderate Alzheimer's. Do you have any suggestions for cleaning out his earwax with compassion while helping him keep his independence? I'm looking for a way to more easily navigate this with him. I think, um, and sorry, the doorbell just rang despite my, uh, despite my signage. Um, so the dogs are barking. Um, I think the important thing would be to seek out an audiologist who um, has expertise in treating folks with dementia. I do think it's worth pursuing to get the earwax um, cleaned out. And, you know, we haven't touched on that. And Lisa, I'm sure knows way more about that than I do. All I know is um, that sometimes when we've had behavioral issues with folks, it has been because of the earwax um, buildup. And once you get the um, earwax removed, uh, the behaviors go away. So I do know that it's something that's worth pursuing. That said, if it's, you know, the reaction to having the ears cleaned is, you know, what we would call a catastrophic reaction, you know, it's just really, 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 um, distressful for that person, then, you know, maybe little bits at a time. Um, but I would consult with an audiologist who absolutely is comfortable treating people with dementia. Lisa probably has more to add to that. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, serum and removal is within the scope of practice of audiology. I personally don't do it, um, but you have to be very careful in the ear canal. So depending on whether this is, you know, soft and it's going to easily come out or whether it's hard and, and attached to the ear canal wall, and you can tell by looking at it. Um, but if you can get the wax out at least once, maybe by an, an ear, nose and throat doctor, and then approach it more from a prophylactic standpoint where you use something like the over-the-counter Debrox, which is just drops you know, maybe you use that once a week and then you can prevent it from recurring. That might be one tack. Or you could just try the, you know, if you say, oh, there's no way I'm going to get him to the doctor, just try the over-the-counter Debrox drops because often that softens it up enough. The ears pretty much clean themselves. They exfoliate from the inside out. So if you can soften the wax, it may just kind of come out on its own with the bath or the shower or whatever. And I think important too to understand, you know, and to continue the person's historical um, you know, uh, 
routines around this, right? Everybody has their own, um, you know, I don't put anything, I have uh, benign um, vertigo. And so I'm very, you know, I don't put any drops or anything in my ears because I don't mm-hmm. want those little crystals going out of whack and then I can't <laughs> sit up. So, you know, I think everybody sort of has their own sensitivities around these things. And and important to understand as we're taking care of people with dementia that that we continue those normal routines and habits uh, to, to clean the ears. No Q-tips. <laughs> I know, right? Nothing in your ear smaller than an elbow. That's what I was right. always told. <laughs> Do you have any tips, Lisa, for convincing people to wear their hearing aid? Oh, if I did. <laughs> so um, I tr- you need to try to maybe get out there. You need to get out what's behind it. You know, is it this negative stigma? Sometimes, um, you know, addressing that, trying to get at, sometimes we use something called like a decisional balance. Like what really are the, the pros and cons? What are the pros of not hearing to you? Well, I don't have to go to church. My wife won't make me go to church. What are the cons of hearing? Well, she'll make me go to church. So you have to look deeper at some of those things. Um, The other big thing is um, self-efficacy. A lot of times people bluster about not wanting to wear their hearing aids, but they really have very low self-efficacy in their ability to manage these. And they're actually quite simple to manage. And that's my job to make you comfortable managing them. Um, So self-efficacy, um, this decisional balance, sometimes people, it's, they perceive it in their best interest not to hear well. Um, and I was going to get at one more thing. And of course, it slipped my mind. I'll think of it in a minute. But getting at the crux of it, um, lots of times people have heard, well, I heard this and I heard that. So again, part of my job is you know, educating people. Um, educating them a little bit. When I start to bring up the cognitive decline issue, I don't want to scare people into wearing their hearing aids, but I can show them, you know, the research behind this. Sometimes that really speaks to people, you know, when they understand some of these negative effects that I've been talking about today, that um, they say, whoa, you know, cognitive decline falls. I could even, I could fall more if I don't wear my hearing aids. Um, So I look for the deeper the deeper reason. Yeah, I think also to communicate to people that it's still important that they're involved and that checking out is not an option we're comfortable with um, as family members or as members of the community, um, that we still want that person's voice and ears <laughs> and hearing and participation in conversations. I think um, letting folks know that uh, as they age is a really important thing. Yeah, that's so true. Juliet, there's a question coming in. Will Brookdale offer this to its residents or do families have to purchase a device? I imagine it can be offered for use at activities from an equity standpoint. Um, It's a great selling feature for the residents, but is it bought or is it available for use? Well, I think, you know, we're adding it to our communities um, on kind of a stay or rollout basis. We um, are um, have it in select communities now. I think when it's in a community, residents are, are certainly, you know, able to use it anytime they want in terms of, you know, if you have a family visitor, or you're doing a, a family dinner um, at the community, that type of thing, we're, we're welcome to, to have everybody use it. Um, you know, there certainly are other personal amplification devices. We did look into some of these as the COVID um, visiting uh, issues came up. And, um, you know, there are some of those amplification devices that are available um, for more one-to-one communication. Um, and we have, you know, we've added some things like old-fashioned um, telephone, um, handheld receivers, I guess they were called back in the day, right? Um, Then we've added some of those to the iPads, which seems to help um, some folks as well with visiting and understanding that they're, that they're actually talking, you know, talking on a phone. Um, So, you know, I would suggest that if folks are having an issue, their, their loved ones are living in a Brookdale community to certainly speak with the health and wellness director or the executive director or the programming person, um, 
about those needs so that we can um, we can get them addressed. Great, thank you for that. So we are coming up on the hour, it went fast. Thank you so much, Lisa, Matt, Juliet. I sincerely wanna thank you all for joining us today. And thanks to all of you for being here and asking all of your questions. We're gonna be emailing you a recording and a transcript to this webinar so you'll be able to review it again or share it with family and friends. And please come back and join us in January for our next webinar, Medication Management. That will be in January. And each of our webinars features a different subject. And you can go to brookdale.com backslash in the know to discover more and see some of our past webinars. And we do hope we'll see you again soon. And so until next year, we hope you stay safe, happy, and well. Thank you so much. Thank you.